Shalom Israel. I'm Brother Athan of the Young Lions of Israel. Today's topic is called A Bit of Understanding in Galatians 4. Um, Galatians, alright? Once again, a bit of understanding. I'm not going to go into the whole book of Galatians, the whole book, too much in there. I'm just going to address the question I was asked. Alright, so let's begin. Galatians 4, verse 8. How be it then? When ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? So Paul is saying, now that you repented in Christ, speaking to the, speaking to the Galatians, he's saying, you were once following idols. Now you repented in Christ. Now you're following the law of sacrifice. Who, 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 who brought you to that? All right, Paul is saying, how are you going to go from being in the world to following Christ to now you're following the law of sacrifice? How did this happen? Because it says here, um, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Because by following the weak and beggarly elements, you're in bondage. So what does bondage represent? In this instance here, it represents the law of sacrifice, the old covenant. All right? Now, before I break that down, I have to go into Acts 15. Acts 15, verse 1. Here we go. And certain men, and certain men, which came down from Judea, taught the brethren, and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Excuse me. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church, and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all the things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So you had certain Israelites who were Pharisees, who, be, who were following Christ, but in the midst of that sect of Pharisees that believed in, that believed in Christ, there were, Israel, there were Pharisees that were teaching the Israelites scattered abroad that they had to keep the law of sacrifice and get circumcised in order to be saved, okay? So this was contrary to what was being taught, all right? They were so you had certain Israelites who were supposedly who believed in Christ that were teaching other Israelites that they had to be that they had to keep the law of sacrifice in order to in order to be saved, which is not so. All right. So now, which is what the bondage that Paul is speaking of. To prove that, let's get, I'm gonna get Hebrews. Um, matter of fact, I'll read on. And the and the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should bear the word, hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, that's the bondage, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. So what was it, what was the yoke that neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Let's get that, let's get the book of Hebrews 8, 7 through 7 to 8. The yoke and the bondage are synonymous. Hebrews 8, 7 to 8. But if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been stored for the second. 
from finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, which is the Gentiles and the Jews in the New Testament. All right. So it says, let me read verse 7 and 8 again. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Jacob. So the Most High found fault with our forefathers in the, under the old covenant. Therefore, he already had set in, no, in motion a new covenant, which is through what? Through the body of Christ. But you had Israelites who were supposedly, who believed in Christ, that were trying to bring them back into that covenant that our fathers, not us, were able to bear. So let's go back to Galatians 4, 9 again. Mm. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Meaning in what? Under the old covenant. Why are you, after you learned Christ, when you were in sin, are you returning to the old covenant? That's not what you were taught, Paul is saying to them. How do you how do you go how, why would you desire to go there? To that covenant? Because you had brethren Israelites in the church of Galatians infiltrating the churches, teaching them what? That salvation comes through the law of sacrifice and circumcision. That's what was that's what was going on. Alright? So let's get Galatians two to prove that. Galatians two, three to four. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, meaning a Greek-speaking Jew, was, com was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren that certain set the Pharisees in Acts 15, they were false brethren. I mean, they didn't really believe in Christ at all. They were coming into the church pretending to believe in Christ only to bring forth that old covenant, to bring them back into the old covenant of sacrifice. All right? And that because of false brethren, unawares, brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. See that? Into the old covenant. That's why it says to spy out our liberty. I'm going to go into that liberty later on. So, so far the bondage is what? The old covenant, that yoke which neither our, us nor our fathers could bear. Now about those false brethren. Let's get 2 Corinthians 11, 26 to see if that happened to them. Would you have false brethren that Paul spoke about to them as well? He spoke to the Corinthians of false brethren as well. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 26. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Could you have false brethren in Corinth as well? So Paul is saying, listen, in this truth, Paul went through many tribulations, including false brethren that you read about earlier. We read about earlier in Acts 15. All right. So Paul is reminding the Corinthians of the false brethren that he had to deal with. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 26. So now let's get Galatians 4, 9 again. Galatians 4, 9 again. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage, which is the old covenant, the law of sacrifice. All right? So let's get Galatians 3 verse 1. Why did, why did they desire to go into bondage again under the old covenant and sacrifice? Why did, was that their desire? Why was this their desire? Galatians 3 verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? Let me read it again. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you? So Paul's making it clear that someone tricked them. 
into desiring to go back into bondage unto the old covenant. I'll read verse 2. This only what I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. So Paul is saying, did you receive um, Christ through the works of the law of sacrifice or by the Spirit of, or, or by hearing of faith? I mean, you heard about Christ dying for our sins, all right, and believe. Which one? See verse 3. Are you so foolish, having begun, begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? I mean, so Paul is asking, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Now, when you read the word flesh, it's two is twofold. Flesh represents the flesh of the animal sacrifices. Flesh represents the law of sacrifice. He asks a question, are you made perfect by the law of sacrifice? Let's get that. Hebrews 10. Verse 1, Paul is saying, by the flesh, are you made perfect? Hebrews 10, verse 1. For the, law ha for the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So Paul is making it clear that the laws of sacrifice, which are a shadow, you know, symbolic to Christ, those sacrifices could not make those who brought the sacrifices perfect. Okay? And those sacrifices could not make the man that offered them or woman that woman that offered them perfect. So Paul asked the Galatians a question. By the flesh are you made perfect? By the flesh of sacrifices are you made perfect? Going back into bondage under the old covenant, keeping the law of sacrifice, are you made perfect? The answer is no. All right, let's go back to Acts 15, verse 10. Who, who bewitched them? Into this madness, the false brethren. That's who. The same false brethren in Acts 15, verse 1 and 5. Acts 15, verse 10. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? That's that bondage again. Okay? Let's get Acts 13, verse 39. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. Because under the law of Moses, the old covenant, if you are homosexual, there was no justification. You were put to death. If you committed bestiality, death. If you committed adultery, death. If you committed murder, death. Okay? You sacrificed unto idols. You went to idolatry, death. All right? But in the new covenant, in the spirit of Christ, we're given mercy, grace, a chance to get ourselves right. All right? I'll read it again. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things, meaning all sins, from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses, meaning under the old covenant, under the yoke which our fathers could not bear. Neither us nor our fathers could bear that bondage. Okay, let's get Galatians 3.11, because Paul repeats it to the Galatians here. Galatians 3.11. In Christ, there's in Christ, there is justification. Under the law of Moses, under the old covenant, there was none. No repentance. Acts 13, verse... No, I'm sorry. Uh, Galatians 3, 11. Lost track for a moment. Give me a second. Galatians 3, 11. Mm -hmm. but, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. Read it again. But that no man is justified by the law, I mean the law, the law of Moses, the law of sacrifice, in the sight of God. It is evident for the, for me because the just shall live by faith. Why? Because he read earlier that the sacrifices offered year by year could not make the comers thereunto perfect. Therefore, the only way Israel can receive mercy is through Christ. Read again. But that no man is, just, is justified, only in Christ are we found to be justified. 
but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith in Christ. That's what Paul is saying to Galatians here. You can't be justified keeping the laws of sacrifice. You can only be justified in the faith of Christ. The just shall live by faith, not by sacrifice, not by the law of Moses, which required sacrifices. All right, John 1, 17. For the law, I mean the law of Moses, the old covenant, was given by Moses. See that? But grace mean mercy, repentance, and truth. When you read Psalms 119, verse 142, it says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. So the law is the truth. The truth is the law. I read it again. For the law was given by Moses. But grace and truth, meaning law, came by Jesus Christ. So we're justified through grace in the law of, in the faith of Christ. That's all that's written here. Okay? That's all that means. So now let's get Galatians 4 verse 9. So grace and truth, meaning grace in the law, comes in Christ. No more sacrifices. Just faith in Christ in the law now. Including the feast days, by the way. Galatians 4, verse 9. But now after that ye have known of God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Galatians 4, verse 10. Ye observe days and months and times and years. So... The, the, the Galatians were fooled back into what? They were fooled back into following what? The old covenant. Involving what? The sacrifices. By observing what? Days, months, times, and years. Offering sacrifices upon those days, months, times, and years. Just to bring forth the proof that, that sacrifices were offered. Ezekiel 45, 17. Ezekiel 45, Ezekiel 45, 17. I think that's it. Let me make sure I write the wrong scripture now. Yep, that's the one. And it shall come to pass. No. Yeah, this is it. And it shall be the prince's part to give burnt offerings and meat offerings and drink offerings. Keep this in mind. Meat offerings and drink offerings. In the feasts, and in the new moons, and in the Sabbaths, in all solemnities of the house of Israel, he shall prepare the sin offering, and the meat offering, and the burnt offering, and the peace offerings to make reconciliation for the house of Israel. So offerings were provided on, on days during certain times of the times, days, months, and years. Meat offerings, drink offerings, sin offerings, burnt offerings. Those were offered on Sabbaths, new moons, all feast days, all feasts, all right? Keep in mind, meat and drink offerings. The Galatians were fooled back into offering these sacrifices during these days, months, times, and years. They were bewitched back in Galatians 3, verse 1, by false brethren in Galatians 2, verse 3 to 4. The same false brethren back in Acts 15, verse 1 through 5, okay? All through 10. All through Acts 15, all right? Colossians 2.16, Paul gave warning of this. About don't let anyone trick you or trick you into observing. Well, let's find out. Don't let, anyone, don't let anyone trick you into observing days, months, times, and years. Colossians 2.16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink. Keep that in mind, meat and drink. Read that earlier. We read, we read meat and drink offerings in Ezekiel 45, 17. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day. How you show respect of a holy day? 
by offering meat offerings, drink offerings, burnt offerings, peace offerings, sin offerings. Okay, those are the offerings that were shown, that were, that were brought forth to show respect of those holy days. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So Paul's making clear that all those, all those meat and drink offerings offered in respect of the holy days, the new moons, the Sabbaths, were all a shadow of things to come, but the body was of Christ. Let's get Hebrews 10 about that shadow of things to come. Hebrews 10 verse 1 again, because he, he was here before. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, which is the body of Christ, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, that's the law he's talking about, which they offered year by year, continually make the comers, meaning the offerers, thereunto perfect. Meaning those who offered thereunto perfect. All right? Because offering sacrifices, the blood of, bull, the blood of bulls or of goats cannot clear your conscience of sins. It cannot make you perfect. All right? Let's get to Hebrews 9, verse 9 now. Now, as a matter of fact, go back to Colossians 2.16. Go back to Colossians 2.16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink. The same meat and drink offerings in Ezekiel 45.17. Paul is telling the Colossians, don't let no man trick you, meaning the Pharisees. Don't allow them to trick you into thinking that you'll receive a judgment against you for not bringing forth meat and drink offerings in respect of an holy day or of the new moons or of the Sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come, what the sacrifices involved in those days, back in Ezekiel 45, 17. But the body is of Christ, because the body, the ultimate sacrifice was of Christ. Hebrews 9, verse 9. Which was a figure for the, for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices, that could not make him that did the service perfect. Read that earlier in Hebrews 10 verse 1. As pertaining to the conscience, to the mind. Verse 10. Which stood only in meats and in drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them. Meaning they were, we were bound to that. We were, we were bound to that covenant. Imposed on them until the time of reformation, until the time of Christ. All right, so the meat and drink offerings were involved in sacrifices. That's the meat and drink that Paul was talking about in Colossians 2.16, which were a shadow of things to come in Colossians 2.17. John 6. John 6.54. I'm ending with this. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. So Christ made it clear that his flesh and blood were meat and drink indeed. Those, his body was the ultimate sacrifice. That's why it says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ, meaning Christ's body was the ultimate sacrifices now. So no longer do we keep the commandments in the feast days offering sacrifices because Christ's body was the ultimate sacrifice. So I hope you get an understanding with that. All right, so with that, I'm going to say shalom. Most high in Christ, bless. Stand the commandments.